Good evening or hello everyone, depending upon what time of the day you're watching this. We are recording it at eight o'clock on Saturday night, the what's the day? The 15th, because I didn't do my homework until the last minute. And John is bailing me out. Uh, so this episode will debut on the 16th. And I'm recording tomorrow with Interstate Man of Mystery Sherman House uh, for next week's episode. And so hey. I actually planned ahead that week and we got it under control. Joining us tonight for I think is his third appearance. Third run. Third appearance on the show is John Murphy. John, for the people who have not been paying attention, tell them who you are. Uh, well, thank you, Lee, for that rousing introduction. <laughs> I'm John Murphy of LPF Training. I'm a full time itinerant instructor. I've been on the road living in my RV Maslow. Now for uh, coming up on two years and two weeks. Uh, I'm starting my third lap around the country. Uh, I returned from a government intelligence agency uh, in January 2021 and been rolling about ever since, teaching various concealed carry classes. All right. And part of that, you were one of God's chosen Marine Corps? I, I did the U.S. Marine Corporation. Uh, I cannot claim to be a combat veteran. I mean, I heard the, I've heard the odd angry shot, and I pointed guns at people and yelled at them in, in languages, and they, they did not understand, and so I yelled louder. And, uh, louder and slower. Yes, and uh, eventually we, we conveyed what, what had to happen. It was, it was most disconcertingly, most disconcerting, yes. I came around the corner, I came down, and this guy with, with an AK with a Beretta, I was holding, holding it down on him, and I said, put the gun down, put the gun down. And he did the craziest thing. He didn't put the gun down. He, I mean, no, he smiled at me. <laughs> like crazy American, what are you what are you doing over here? This is Mogan <laughs> issue, man. We point guns at each other by way of saying hello all the time. Uh, and then the, my guy my guy swarmed him and we got him down. It was uh, you know, America hauls him on his and he had a permit, he was a guard, and then we dusted him off and went our way. So another, another great moment in American military execution of foreign policy. I, I have had a similar experience in a parking lot in Northeast Georgia, pointing a pistol at someone and them not being impressed about it, with it at not, all. Not remotely. And I'm like, I'm pointing a gun at you. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is the fifth time today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, those other people weren't worried about the legalities of shooting me. You actually are. So. Uh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is actually kind of liberating in, in some regards, isn't it? For, for yep, that. yep. All right. Well, we have both a step forward in technology tonight and a step back in technology tonight. The step back in technology tonight is that the cardboard box that I normally set my laptop on to get it at the height to do the video somehow was damaged and my computer was sitting at an angle. So we have grabbed a box of Cheetos. Oh, that we're sitting the uh, the computer on tonight, and uh, so that is our step back in technology. We had to replace a damaged cardboard box. The step forward in technology is John asked, "Hey, is there a way to share my screen during this?" So for those of you that are on the YouTube channel watching the episode, you will get to see John's PowerPoint as we go through this. Uh, for those of you that watch on Spotify, because now the episodes go out in video on Spotify as well, you'll be able to watch it. For everyone else, just John will have to do a very good job of describing uh, what he has on the screen. Uh, speaking of the YouTube channel, uh, if you would be so kind as to subscribe to it at Showtime tonight, I think we're at 942 subscriptions. I've got to get to 1,000 before I can turn on some of the features, and I would like to do that, which which point in time they'll actually pay attention and see that it has gun content and turn all the features off, but at least I want to reach that milestone. But we'll see. John, tell everybody what you're going to tell them about tonight. Well, uh, we're going to talk about the, a, a skill acquisition paradigm. And, and Lee, my, my screen is broadcasting. You're seeing it? Yep, I see it. Right, lovely. Uh, because going down this pathway, and, you know, perhaps better title is what the hell do I need to know? If, if anyone has any self-awareness at all, like beyond, like, I need to get a gun to get a gun, they have to come, they'll, they will come to a realization that, holy cow, I am, I'm really getting a hold of something here that there are a lot of consequences to it. 
And the more you know, the more you appreciate that there is to know. So I would also, you know, this is a Tiffany slide. This is just one guy's opinion. And there are certainly others out there that will have various other uh, approaches to this. Uh, but I am of the belief that we need to acquire a uh, uh, skill sets that interlock and overlap to support our overall strategy, which is just to get home. We just want to get home. I'm not out there to inflict my will upon anybody or, or make a point or, 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 or I, I any of that. I just want to get home. And with that realization of that responsibility, like uh, if you look at a, a local cl uh, crime reports or whatever, you're like, okay, I need to get it done, take care of myself, my family, my loved ones. And then you say, holy cow, by doing that, I am acquiring a whole slew of responsibilities. And it can be initially overwhelming. And I will also say there is, are a lot of pathways out there you can follow, uh, some of which are more productive than others. Uh, my friend, the late Pat Rogers, referred to the internet not as the information superhighway, but as the di disinformation cow path. So, and that, and now suddenly you're, you're another another choice is thrust upon you. Who do I listen to? What what sources do I do I take? I don't know to vet anybody. Well, here here are my thoughts on it. And like we, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the proverbial one step. And we should go, our goal should be taking the small steps. Now, some of the skills that we acquire are concurrent with each other. Others will become sequential. But altogether, they'll be highly consequential and we can never let it just stop. Uh, I learned today in a conversation with one of my colleagues, Gabe White, uh, at a dinner. When well, holy cow, that had never occurred to me. So we, when you think you have it all is the first clue that you, you really don't. Now, this is a quote from my good friend, John Holsham. And I got this, uh, I talked to him about, oh, a year and a half ago when I was putting this together. And he made the observation, at, at some point you shoot good enough. Now, that is a, a result, there's a traditional focus on the gun. We got the gun, we have a gun, we gotta work the gun, 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 shoot, 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 shoot. Well, in reality, that, that coming out of the holster and shooting is a highly consequential event. There are a whole slew of things we need to, to, to learn and understand before that moment, which may actually enable us to avoid that moment. And then after we we've, we've, have applied force, well then, holy cow, we have just stepped through the looking glass and now I had to deal with, with the legal, AKA the justice system. And we got to know about that. So if you apportion all of your time to just getting that sub second draw, that, that magic uh, bill drill down or things of that nature, well, that's, that's all well and good, but those, that particular skill has got to be supported by others. Well, before so, you move on from, from Mr. Sure. Holsham there, let, let me just point out to the audience that uh, John Holsham was a guy who was whacking our enemies when they spoke Russian and was still in the business of whacking our enemies when they started speaking Arabic. Uh, he, he was involved and may still be in, in, in that pastime for a long time. And uh, he's he's a gentleman that when he speaks, you pay attention to. And I learn stuff just from the questions that he asks because uh, it I'm, causes I'm, me to think. I'm glad you pulled me back. Uh, he is a profound, profound individual. And if you think you you have measured the depth of John Holsham, you no no you haven't, you haven't. There, there's going to be more there. Uh, I think he's going on the road. If this coming year, he's got some classes scheduled up. I'm, I'm afraid I can't recall the name of his business at this moment, but he's he's getting out there. Uh, I know his uh, he's got a range north of Seattle. Right. Uh, but um, he's, got, he's got some road classes coming up. Okay. I need to get that scheduled then. So uh, here here's a graphic that illustrates my point. We do a lot of shooting. Maybe a little bit of self-defense law, uh, laws of ownership for your state or municipality. Well, then we'll maybe shoot some more. Uh, but frequently we buy the gun, we run a magazine or two through it and it goes into a sock drawer. Never gonna be seen again. 
So to my mind, self-defense training needs to be contextual. And I've defined these layers of context which surround us constantly. First, that there is the physical layer. Right now, I'm, I'm broadcasting to you from my RV Maslow in Homestead, Florida, from Homestead, Florida. Not much space about, uh, but other physical layers to be concerned would be parking lots, convenience stores, department stores, your own home, the physical layout of the environment you are in. And within that, you can probably even take into account the physical abilities of the people that are there with you. Uh, it's, I hate to be crazy, but younger men are more capable of physical violence than most. I, I know it's crazy to say that, but yet, been my experience. Uh, then we live in a legal environment that's wrapped around us. Now, this one's getting increasingly interesting because you would like to think that the law is pretty universal wherever you go. Well, a legit self-defense shooting in, say, Houston uh, will get you prosecuted in, in, say, New Jersey, depending upon that. And it, it, even in the same state, if you're in the, you know, the Lone Star state of Texas, and you are subjected to, say, the prosecutor in Austin. Well, that might be a different deal than it would be, you know, just 25, 30 miles down the road. So you need to be cognizant of the legal environment around you, the laws of self-defense, the laws of ownership, the laws of storage. Uh, then we need to be aware of, of the cultural environment around us. Uh, I use example in, in downtown D.C. Uh, on a Saturday night, I could be... Uh, salsa dancing in one moment. I go down a few blocks. I'm in Chinatown. Uh, a few more blocks and it's, it's hummus. And a few more blocks, it's like, total, we are not in Kansas anymore, are we? And we need to be cognizant of the culture environment that we are in. I, I will also talk about the emotional environments we can encounter. Uh, each environment can, can be emotionally charged. Political events have become profoundly emotionally charged. Uh, weddings funerals, divorces, you know, talk about the high and the low all in one, in one thing. And there have been multiple cases of extreme violence taking place in and around, around that particular legal venue, a, a divorce, because the emotions are so high. Uh, another thing I'm studying, well, road rage can become highly emotional. Uh, these are things we need to be cognizant of. Now, wrapped around all these uh, layers, is the temporal layer, time. And because it just keeps on ticking, do, 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 do. Oh, that was bad. Never again will I try that joke. <laughs> uh, time keeps moving on. Uh, what is a legal use of force in one instant? It, one instant will get you jammed up the next. I would even burrow down so far as to say the right word at the wrong time or the wrong word at the wrong time has put you into that temporal loop. And these things will always have, they have a before, a during, and an after. And we have to understand that that timeline keeps running. Here we are. Uh, things when you think about our lifestyle, pre-incident behaviors and skills, incident skills, and then post-incident skills. Now we're talking about skills. What we really need is a disciplined, a multidisciplinary integrated approach to the problem. And at that moment, all these things need to mesh together like, like fine gears, shifting gears down the highway. Now, historically, we focused on the gun, but there's a lot more to it. So we, I use the analogy here. And by the way, this is a Tiffany PowerPoint. So you know it's going to be really, <laughs> really visually stunning. We, we got to eat the elephant. And we got to know, here are, here are the skills of the chunks of this element. What are our human performance factors? Uh, we, we tend to concentrate on how fast we can draw and shoot that first best shot. But, well, how far can I run? How long does it take me to run five yards? How quickly can that person close on me? Uh, next up, we need to understand human psychology and conflict. Physiology, proximics, the science of how, what when things are close to you, how that how you react to that, uh, and uh, you know down here le less lethal, ballistics. Do we need to become martial sano experts? No, but we, we need to understand 
what Bullet need to do on our behalf. Uh, how yeah, that, that's one point I'd like to elaborate on right there, because as you're saying, people tend to focus on the amount of time it takes to make that first best shot, etc. That presumes that that first best shot is going to immediately incapacitate and stop the attacker. Yeah. And as we well know, that is typically not the case. Not the case. Uh, yeah. but, but my point four or five manly, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, th uh, and beyond that, well, crime and criminals, and then, then you, what, what conflict looks like. Uh, a lot of the cases I study start, start, start out as two relatively reasonable, intelligent individuals, and then someone has a, a, gets affronted. About two, three months ago, there was an incident where two fathers, both of them with their children in their car, were driving around shooting each other like a gangland, shoot, gangland shootout. It was down here in Florida. Now, I'm not going to say naturally, but there we go, naturally. Uh, and they both got jammed up really hard. One of the girls got shot, was wounded, and, and that and over. I, I think the, the 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 initiating factor was someone got cut off, and rather than they just forgive someone's trespasses against us, as I, he couldn't do it. Um, on that note, I, I just had a student email me. Uh, he was all proud of what I what I taught him came into play, until it didn't. And he was essentially run off the road in his van, got back on the road, and he had a dash camera. And he was determined to capture this guy's license plate. So he aggressively pursued this guy. Uh, fortunately, the other guy did not react to that, but I, I asked him, what, what could possibly have gone wrong? Other than that he suddenly stops and produces a gun. It, it, there are so many layers to wrap to this. And uh, yeah. bottom line, I will default to a saying I've had is gun goes on, ego comes off. Now let's move yeah. back to the next, and, next And slide. another note on conflict there, if one party realizes they're in a conflict and the other one doesn't, <laughs> there's a completely different uh, span of reaction and response times in that. That, that, is a, that is a gap of the sort that John Farnham talked about and uh, he talked about skill gaps. And I'm coming to understand that frequently it's an understanding gap. Uh -huh. And to, to borrow from, a phrase from him, we die in the gaps. We do. And that understanding gap will put you behind. If, if this is the curve, and here is you behind the curve. And, and again, environmental understanding. What kind of situation am I involving myself in right now? And how do I, how do I get out of this thing? So all of these skills have to be leavened with common sense and emotional control. And that last part, well, that comes from a strict self-assessment. So there are barriers to training. And my friend Memphis Beach on the YouTubes, recently a student in my, in my uh, class I had uh, in Nashville, like Top Gun Academy, what a lovely town. Uh, people have all kinds of excuses not to train. And he has, some, he has some really great videos on his YouTube channel. All these, ego is a big one. Uh, ignorance, well, I don't need to know that. Uh, fear, well, I don't want to expose my weakness or my failings to, to my fellow students. And then there's inertia. I'll get to that later. I'll get to that later. So here, there's a quick shot. Uh, YouTube.com uh, backslash C backslash Memphis Beach. He's got a pretty good channel. Uh, speaking of Memphis, he is starting his own podcast. I don't know the name of it, but he's in the works of starting it. And I will be a guest on that coming up in a few weeks. Well, look at that. So, he, he, yeah, if you were in the That Weems Guy Show Facebook group, you'll probably see linkage to that at some I'm point. Gonna in time. Stay, I'm going to stay tuned to that. Yeah. So I will make an observation here that if you're listening to this podcast, you are not the norm. Uh, you are, you've already sought knowledge, information, and experience beyond that simple gun. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe the Delta Force analogy is a little bit strained, but you are in the 0.1% of gun owners in this country right now. And then we have to watch out for the Dunning-Kruger effect. 
And it's very simple, easy to follow prey to this. You take a class or two and suddenly you're an expert. But the more classes you take, you realize, holy cow, there's a lot more to know. And the more you know, the, the, more, the more you know that you don't know. And it, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. And it can take a, a matter of time before you have at least a beyond a nascent understanding across this spectrum of skills. So now we have to th talk about what, what is sufficient. I mean, if at some point you shoot well enough, what, what is that point? You know, well, you have to take into account the tyranny of time. So if you take all your, your time for training and preparation, well, then other parts of your life are going to suffer. And, and vice versa. You will be unprepared if you don't put enough work into it. I mean, the phrase that we've all been using for years now has been, do the work. So first, we have to absorb our mission, which is just to get home. I just want to get home. I want to uh, preserve my health and what meager savings I've got. And the best way to, to do that, to, to, to achieve that rather, is to avoid violent physical com conflict or criminal criminality. Uh, I need to, to define who my inner circle is. If I don't have a firm sense of inner circle, well, I can start involving myself in things that I shouldn't get involved in, third party interventions. Uh, I have a, a 45 minute YouTube video on that on my channel, FBF Training, which talks about how you can go from hero to zero or dead in a third party intervention. So we, we had, need to achieve pre-decisions about what, what we will or will not get, get involved in with. I want to preserve my freedom, drive, continue to drive around this great country. I don't want to enforce the law. I do not want to inflict my will on somebody else. Uh, my, I'm wearing a gun, so I have no ego. I want to protect that. And I do not want to be motivated by revenge uh, because the law will take a very, very dim view of that. So traditionally, we emphasize hard skills. Uh, we like those because we can quantify them. But there are soft skills, and they're largely unappreciated, but uh, and just as crucial. Let me give you some examples here. Uh, well, here, if you're watching, the, watching the, you know, the little, Tiffany got the little thing to swirl around. I'm so proud of her for doing that. Uh, an example of a hard skill it's an achievement-based thing. I pulled off a sub-second shot, or I've got a I can I can hit a 50-yard target in 1.2 seconds. It's outcome-focused, and there there are defined metrics to it, and we like it because we're doing something physically. Now, soft skills. Well, oh, here's some examples of hard skills: load, unload, reload, clear a malfunction, apply a pepper spray, uh, apply a tourniquet. De a de defeat a choke, uh, marksmanship at an appropriate speed and appropriate distance, draw from concealment. Those are hard skills. We all love to work on those. Coming down though, and, he and here's an example of a hard skill. This is our friend, John, uh, John Hearn. And this chart has gone through a variety of uh, iterations, but essentially what, what if we want to achieve automaticity with our hard skills, Meaning that we have trained the skill to the point that we can largely keep our, our higher brain involved in solving the problem while our lower brain actually comes out and produces a pistol, produces a pepper spray or whatever, without any conscious thought into it. That is a lovely state of being. And John is kind of quantified here. Uh, if you shoot, for instance, on this chart, a casino drill in under 15 seconds, well, you have achieved automaticity. You can run a pistol in that course of fire without putting too much thought about what you got going on. Uh, other, other iterations he've got, he, ha, he would have here, if you can shoot the, an IDPA sharpshooter classification, well, then you, you are achieving some levels. Now, John recently did a podcast, I, I would commend it to you, doesn't really cover this, but he had a lot of in-depth things, the other things he does on human performance factors. So these are the hard skills that we like to quantify and get, and get learned. Now the soft skills. 
these are much more behavioral and interpersonal. How do I talk to somebody? At some point, you have to have uh, an aperture to understand, I need to talk to this person at, at an appropriate level. Uh, it's much more instinctive. It's very difficult to teach. Harder to practice outside of like Toastmasters or, or an environment like that. Uh, impossible to measure. You don't go to a match uh, 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 and on the beat, how quickly can you can can you achieve deconfliction with somebody over a parking park, parking spot dispute? Beep and go. I'm sorry, sir. Pardon me. It's my fault. This is your spot. You just can't. There's no timing to that, so there's no no immediate gratification or reward. Not as fun, but just as crucial. Other things we need to think about is uh, reading a person or a room. Uh, in my former life in the intelligence community, I would go, go to meetings and I would do what I could to research the bios of the people that were going to be in the room and their backgrounds. Like, okay, what is this guy gonna be? What's his, where's he coming from? What's his angle? Uh, that would be reading people in, in a room. Now, if I'm, a, if I'm on the street, well, suddenly I'm, no, I'm not really probably not dealing with Ivy League educated individuals, uh, it might be a little bit different. So we have to have the ability to scale up and down to that. We need to understand the relationship between time, distance, and speed, because they mesh. Uh, if we, I, I mean, I'm gonna use a term just to get a laugh out of Lee, the Tuller drill. Oh yes, oh the pain, poor, 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 poor Mr. Tuller. Uh, much more better defined as the Tuller principle, which is well, from seven yards, a healthy man can be on you in about two seconds. And uh, I, I my, my last class, my decrepit 16 year old butt closed seven yards in 2.2 seconds. If you've got a 1.5 second draw stroke, well, that leaves you 0.2 seconds to make a decision of what you're going to do. That's just not enough time. So those three attributes, time, speed, and distance, distance interlock. We need to navigate life situations. Uh, uh, for instance, I don't know, I had a conflict in a laundromat a couple of years ago. That could have gone really stupid. I got, I got the hell out. Uh, recognizing key terrain, both uh, physically, and culturally, emotionally, what's happening in that space? What is the highlight, the nexus of that particular, of, of that particular time and space to find yourself in? This next one is a, a term from, from our, our friend, Craig Douglas. He refers to it as verbal agility. Uh, I like the capacity to, to uh, maintain separation via verbalization but sometimes you have to engage people and sometimes you have to convince them of something that may not be true. And well, it's, that would be called lying. And we, 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 we have, some people are better at it than others, the poker face or whatever. But at some point, here's a thought. If I draw to the ready on someone because I'm convinced he's about to assault me, I need to convince that person beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he is less than a second away from getting shot. I've got to sell that. And that, that will take a, a, a form of agility and sincerity. Because there, as we and I were discussing earlier, there is an element of human society that will be totally unimpressed with your pistol. And if they don't believe you, well, no, I don't think you will. I think I'll walk over there and take that gun from you and use it on you. If they don't believe you, well, you, you, you're gonna, they're, they're gonna find out. Keeping your cool. Uh, this is one which is increasingly difficult in an emotionally charged world. Uh, a few words can set people off. Also, keeping your cool after you have been physically accosted. If someone gives you a shove or even a punch, it's not going to kill you, much more than, more than likely. And that might not be the time you stroke out that concealed pistol. In fact, it probably isn't, but it may be. But keeping your cool under that, under that form 
of a, of a, uh, being antagonized, well, that's, that's a soft skill that you need to work on. So here's uh, the award for winning a gunfight. The guy's getting a big medal in the medallion. And then this is for the people who weren't watching. We, we pan out. There's a whole host of things above winning a gunfight with avoidance being the number one prime, prime winner. Avoid the circumstances and situations. So here we have our hard and soft skills rolling through those environments. I was so proud of Tiffany for that one too. She did <laughs> such a fine job of that. Uh, our hard and soft skills roll through the physical, legal, cultural, emotional, and temporal environment seamlessly until we get out of there. And then where do we go? We go home. Now we document progress with the timer. It's easy. Uh, those little, that little digital display will tell you the whole story. Time to your first shot, time to your splits, how long you were to reload or reduce the malfunction. Uh, to, to mix the metaphor, the timer never blinks. With the virtue of, of avoidance, well, that's its own reward. Uh, this past summer, I had a moment. I was driving through Texas looking for an RV park on a side road. And in Texas, the speed limit on a side road is 70. All right. And I knew I had a truck behind me, but he was a, a fair bit back. But I am mentally attuned to 45 miles an hour on a road like that. And GPS said your, your left turn in a half a mile. Now I'm thinking, well, I've got some time. Well, I did not have any time. And I made a rather abrupt left turn into this place. And the guy behind me honked because he probably had to slap on his brakes. I was slowing, but I, I did not give him a few breaks, you know, flashes myself to let him know. So this is entirely on me. I make the turn on in the RV park, and I park, I plug in. And I thought, you know, that guy was pretty upset. I wonder if he's going to come back. And I look up, and he's pulling into the RV park, looking around, look, searching for me. I thought, well, this, is, this has become a day now, hasn't it? This is a thing. He pulled around me, stopped. Looked at my RV, recognized I, I had a bike in the back. It was very obvious which one was what. And then he left. And then I went back. I unplugged my RV. I got on the phone, Google, RV parks near me. And I got the hell out. Because I did not want to have him show up at my, at my door at 2 o'clock in the morning with his friends to have that discussion. That was my, that was my ninja self-defense move. I ran away. <laughs> Shamelessly. So the mission drives everything. Uh, a grocery store run and then get back home. So you think about the tasks. We'll have to navigate to the store, interact with people, uh, inflation, corral the kids, load the vehicle, navigate home. So there are a whole suite of skills that you may not appreciate that, appreciate that they're tied to that particular task. So that's pretty much where I have a question here uh, on this particular topic. So this next up, I started this out as a kind of a bingo game approach, but I decided I didn't, didn't like that. And right now I've defaulted to, to a layered approach. So this will be how I have defined the first layer, or I should say in this case, layer zero. And layer zero is know yourself. What sets you off? What causes inattention with you? What puts you in a mental state that is not conducive to just getting home. Uh, I have on my YouTube channel, I have a, a, a good 20 minute video on, on understanding yourself. There's a lot to it. Uh, you think about, you were kind of a select, uh, the human being is an input device in some regards. Uh, you are a collection of buttons, what, dial switches and levers. And if you give somebody access to your buttons, dial switches and levers, well, they can trigger you into something that is not going to be productive for anybody. So guard your emotions by all means. Know, know yourself and then know your inner circle, the people near you. Uh, I have a friend who sometimes will take it upon himself to enforce societal standards. And I have, I have he's a pretty big guy, a pretty big capable dude. But uh, there's always somebody out there that is going to rise to your challenge. 
And for me to insert myself in a circumstance like that, it has got to really be something worth it. You know, and along with that is when people imagine themselves in these situations, they always presume oh. that they're going to win. And they're always right. Yeah. They're always right. The other side gets a vote. It's like the whole argument over de-escalation. Well, the cops should have de-escalated that. Well, if the other side doesn't agree to be de-escalated, then uh, de-escalation doesn't work. What, what, I, the, I, the, what I use for that situation, my statement there is that person has a 51% controlling majority of what is or isn't going to take place. And if they, if they refuse to de-escalate, well, then we're going to have to find another way. Uh, you're probably you're aware of one of my favorite law enforcement sayings. And I was know what means uh, in law enforcement, sir. Is there anything I can say or do to have you leave right now? No. Well, then you 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 you, you just gave him a binary decision. So there's no more negotiation. Well, then he's bought the ticket. He's taken the ride. And we had to have that capacity to recognize. Well, sir, I just want to go home. Will you let me go home? No. Well, then, there we go. You've asked politely. Uh, I would think about the legal and more, uh, social goodwill you have, will have bought by that. So I, I just want to leave. You, would you let me leave, please? No. Then there's a thing that happens. The police get involved. The witnesses. Well, what happened here? Uh, well, that guy there said he just wanted to go home, and that guy over there went up and laid his hands on him. Wouldn't let him leave. So that guy pepper sprayed him. Oh, so maintaining that high ground is beneficial all the way home. So once you know yourself, and you got to trust yourself to, to store a gun, and you also have the capacity, and I'm, I'm having to work with this still, to forgive yourself when you have a moment of humanity. Uh, if you obsess on it, no one's doing any good. You're not doing anybody any good. Level one skills for me, uh, purchasing a firearm, storing it, understanding the types of violence you're gonna, going, going to be getting involved with. Uh, we just had, I, I referred John's uh, uh, webinar from a few weeks ago. There are types of violence. Now, in, in the moment, that's not really particularly of any great different impact. If someone's wailing away, wailing, wailing away on you, it doesn't matter if it's predatory violence or expressive violence, that doesn't matter. Now, but before that moment, or to borrow a phrase, to the left of bang, if I understand what expressive violence is, and I can see it come my, coming my way, and that gives me time to de-escalate and depart, or just depart. Uh, knowing your circle, uh, group dynamics, Things, a little, little human psychology. Uh, I'm going to borrow now this next one from our, our good friend, Master John Farnham, and understanding the rules of stupid. And that is, don't go to stupid places at stupid times and do stupid things with stupid people. And if you adhere to that, it's amazing how calm and sedate your life can be. I mean, I can recall a time when two o'clock in the morning was a, was a early night for me. And now it's like, uh, nine o'clock. Uh, about that time. And then my, I get a text. Who, who would dare text me at this ungodly hour? Uh, now, John Korea of Active Self Protection, he has kind of a caveat to this. You can generally violate one of the rules of stupid. But for every rule you violate, you are get, garnering an exponential likelihood of a bad, bad outcome. And by the time you get you know three or four rules of stupid together, well, Stand by. Next one is uh, pre estate indicators. We're all about shooting, but what happened, happens before from a criminal assault paradigm, what does it look like before it happens? And I just happen to have a pretty cool video on my YouTube channel on criminal assault pre estate indicators. Uh, now you'll see this particular slide, if you're watching it, uh, most of these skills are blue. And blue reflects a soft skill. Now over here, I have stop bleeding, and that's a red hard skill. Uh, here's one from uh, Colonel John Boyd, the OODA cycle, observation, orientation, decision, action. 
And what is situational awareness? As our mentor Tom would say, it, it distills to who is around me and what are they doing? And another thing I got from Tom, Tom recently, and it's a brilliant assumption, is he assumes everybody he meets is crazy and has a gun. And if you start with that assumption, well, then you can be pleasantly surprised when you encounter a normal human being. I think that makes a lot of sense. You need to understand ego and consequences and uh, appropriate levels of force, the laws of self-defense, as it were. You need to achieve pre-decisions and set boundaries, primarily physical boundaries. I will not let people get that too close to me. But you can also have mental and emotional boundaries as well that you, you, want, to, you want to enforce. Uh, this all comes back down to basic, basic human psychology, wrapped around understanding yourself. Layer two, laws of self-defense, making informed purchases. Now, this is one where, where novices, well, I will confess, as many here watching and listening probably have, at one point I had the box. And that was a box of really good ideas. Uh, the first handgun I ever bought was a Colt Lightweight Commander. And I pretty much bro broke the bank on that, on that thing. Didn't have much money left. And well, I didn't buy a holster. Well, for a paltry $9.95, and this is in like $1982, so we're talking like several thousand today, I got a floppy neoprene thing with a metal clip on it. And I, by God, I had a holster. And, uh, and then someone took me aside and introduced me to Van Galco. And I might have learned a thing or two about holstering the gun without involving just one hand. The mouth of the holster has to stay open. There's certain things that holsters need to do. And that, that neoprene piece of crap, it just, it just wasn't doing it. Uh, here, right along, up, uh, moving over now, I got basic combatives. Uh, can you put your hands up and bat off a, a, a blow? Can you shove someone away? Can you throw a punch? Can you take a punch? Fundamentals of marksmanship. Uh, the five rules of gun safety. I know, for, you know, we got the traditional four. Uh, I've added a fifth. That is engage your brain before you touch the gun. And every time you touch a firearm, you are, you are handling a lethal instrument. And that is a moment where complete, complacency, complacency or neglect well, it can bite you pretty hard. Uh, concealing a handgun upon the body, there's art, an art to it. Uh, if you can go to the Filster YouTube channel, they have a whole series on what concealment looks like. And we are, we are blessed right now with a host of companies producing some really amazing stuff. Uh, I can recommend without hesitation, Filster, Dark Star Gear, JM Custom Kayaks, Spectra Keepers. But there are numerous other companies out there cranking out some really great gear. So be informed, uh, and that way you can avoid maybe acquiring the box. Uh, basic manipulations, load, unload, reload, reduce malfunctions. That's pretty much all we have to do with a pistol. Uh, achieving conscious confidence, that's back to working toward automaticity. If I think about these things, I can do it. Uh, moving over now to managing unknown contacts, where again, we're, I'm going back to a Craig Douglas uh, approach, his terminology, managing unknown, or I would even add unwanted contacts. Uh, my first exposure in this regard came from, from John Farnham. He calls it talking to Goofy. And that is throwing up a word, verbal barrier, backed up by physical posture, like, whoa, whoa, buddy, would you stop right there? Stop right there, please. To screen out ambiguity. And if these people stop, well, then, then maybe it's just a shakedown. So I'm, I'm, I can't help you, and we move on. If they continue to encroach, well, I, my, my saying in that regard is movement is eloquent communication. So it's things we need to understand. We move up to uh, perhaps buying a long arm at this point, maybe. Uh, positioning in a room or in a crowd, what, what, what does that look like? What does that mean? Your home environment skills. How do I perform self-defense at home? Pepper spray. We need a form of uh, less lethal, and pepper spray is a pretty, you know, pretty darn good one. Uh, 
maybe uh, we have, a, I call here the dial. I can dial things up, I can dial things down. Escalate, de-escalate. You can de-escalate by escalation. But again, I would use this analogy here. You are, you are, you just strum the chord of doing banjos. Dun, 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 dun. Well, if someone decides to go up another, another, another octave, well then, how does that end? You have to think that through. This needs to be leveling, leveling in some basic four sign four force or scenario training. Uh, consider a prepaid defense plan. Uh, I don't mean to insult anyone, but general fitness goes a long way. Uh, if you can't walk a mile in 20 minutes, and I know some people just physically can't, do what you can to improve yourself. It's all it takes. Uh, and then drawing from concealment. That, then we go from level two now up to layer three. Now you're noticing layer one didn't even involve really a gun. Now we moved up. We have other skills to worry about. Uh, One-handed manipulations in shooting. Understanding that re relationship between time and timing. Uh, I know if I have a 1.5 second draw stroke and I find myself in a situation where I only have maybe one second of time because this guy's eyes are on me or his muzzle is on me, something of that nature. Well, I need to understand that it's not my timing moment. It has not arrived. Street and counter tactics, uh, advanced combatives. And let me throw this out right now. A lot of our friends are heavily involved in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world. And it's lovely to watch them burrow down. And I don't want to use the characterization of a rabbit hole. But you can, because it, there's a lot, of, a lot at the end. There, it just takes like it, there are layers and layers and layers beneath many of these skill sets that go profoundly deep. And a lot of people find themselves doing that. It's it's a lovely thing. Uh, I'm grabbing a couple here. Mass violence reaction. I had a student this past weekend was in a mall this past summer, and she's armed. She's there with her wife and two kids. End of the day. They got, got to get the shopping done, so they split up. Uh, my student looks up and sees a wall of humanity running at her, screaming. Well, that's, a, that's in the intelligence business, we would call that an indicator. And sure enough, there was a gun scare. Well, it just so happened that they were separated. It, was, it, it just kept falling apart. Understanding how your, your family, your, your circle is going to act in that circumstance is something that you, you kind of train up as a group. Now, characteristically, her mother was with her as well. And she said, okay, let's make a run for it. And she ran with her kid and she looked, got to where they were going, looked behind and dragging behind her, still pushing the shop, shopping cart was mom. Because mom could not let go mentally. She couldn't shift the gears that we've, we've shifted from shopping to saving our lives. And that's, that's a skill set. Uh, the vehicle environment, force on force, advanced fitness, driving skills, achieving unconscious competence, these are all a layer above. Now, once you achieve these, these skills, like a, a, like a fighter pilot, this guy's flying an F-22, he has to fly 10 or 12, 12 hours a month to maintain currency. If he doesn't, skills degrade. Uh, some years ago, I, I deployed, I came back to the range, I thought, well, I'll just get right back into it with my, you know, my zippity fast draw stroke. No, I could not. Uh, you have to maintain currency in your hard and soft skills. And the head, the head game, your mindset, your predecisions, that is the foundation. And if your foundation fails, I don't care how fast you can draw, draw a pistol or how fast you can run or how quickly you can punch someone. The head game fails, the whole the, the whole house falls. So maintaining currency, we study what we need to uh, what we need to learn, we acquire, we validate these skills under pressure, preferably force on force, but certainly with a timer. And then we sustain them and it's a constant cycle. And eventually over time you may find something during your ongoing studies, holy cow, this is a this is a better technique. No problem out with the old and with the new. For instance, in my classes, I teach pepper spray. Generally, that's a whole new thing for people to think about. 
Well, you acquire a new weapon or a new capability, you have to train to integrate both that skill set and integrate that skill with everything else. It's just another thing. It's another thing, if I can quote Forrest. Uh, physical capability, you don't need to be a CrossFit champion, but just, just be better. Uh, I'm using a thing now. I'm living in an RV. I can't carry weight show me. I have a thing called X3. It's rubber bands. And it's, it's my, it gets my muscles worked out. So I've got some, some, six, some modest suggestions for a, uh, essentially skill sustainment regimen. So hard skills, maybe once a, three times a week, a 15 minute dry fire session, uh, throw in a couple of critical applications or bowel dressing, bandage applications, practice, practice drawing your pepper spray. You got to head that down, you know, to a, to a science because you're, it's a weapon you're employing and three hours of physical activity. For your soft skills, uh, I'm, I am a big fan of John Korea's Active Self-Protection Channel. So watch a couple of his, of his five-minute videos a week just to see what crime looks like because when you're doing that, you are acquiring vicarious experience. And your mind won't really recognize the difference between the two. Like, oh, I can recall that video when this when, when these three guys were walking towards someone and they spread out. Oh, I know what this is. And you can take that lesson on board. Have what if discussions with people of like mind or your family, like your spouse and your kids. What if we're what if we're at the car putting groceries away and someone someone comes up and, and asks for a dollar? What do we do? Have that kind of thought. And then find some affinity groups of like-minded people and work these things out with them. Uh, monthly hard skills, shoot a match. Alternatively, if you subscribe to the Range Master newsletter, you've got, if only there were a thing called the drill of the month. Every month, you can shoot a drill. And if you join the right Facebook groups, you can throw up your target. You can, you can, you can critique yourself, throw it out there, hold yourself accountable. It's a good thing. And then more what if uh, conversations with friends and family. What if, what if, what if? And read a book on a related topic. There are numerous books I've got here in Maslow. The, the Little Black Book of Violence. Uh, Straight Talk on Armed Self-Defense with Masayub and a bunch of our other friends. Uh, no, numerous books, just read, read a book. Keep that mind engaged. Uh, annually, you should probably attend my class annually. Think of it as your annual booster. Uh, Scenario-based or decision-making tra making training. I cannot emphasize that enough. Good force on force or just plain old scenario training does so much to raise your shock threshold and give you a sense that I've seen this before. So I, I'm still in my comfort zone. And public speaking. If you, if you have a hard time with it, join Toastmasters. Uh, I recently watched a podcast where Craig Douglas recommended uh, speed dating, that, that kind of thing. I mean, you're, you're selling something. You're trying to sell something. And next up, live your life unbounded. Uh, think about this, but not to the point where you don't do what you want to do and live the way you want to live. Uh, maybe a, a couple hours a week, We'll see you through a 24, 30 hour commitment a year. And that should be enough to get you through the rough points of life. Now here I have a, 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 just an example, I call it the dial. I mentioned earlier, I had to have a dial for my skills. This is some thought I'm having here. Down here I've got, and this is nowhere near to scale. I've got a pleasant social exchange. Uh, hello, sir, how are you? And you know what? Normal human beings do that all the time. I like to say hi to people for a couple of reasons. First, I like to be polite. And secondly, that if I give someone a polite greeting and I get one in return, there's probably a pretty good chance I'm not going to have a problem with that person, particularly if we both just keep on walking. Then we've had awkward encounters. And we've all had, had, some, had, had our share uh, a year or so ago, I'm in a gun store where a guy just came up and said something. I was having a conversation with him. He was like kind of a goomba, but okay. And then he just became profoundly racist. 
and I just excused myself. And then I thought, the more I thought about it, I thought, well, how dare you? How dare you presume? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm some kind of kindred spirit. I, he, I can't, he, then he laughed, but just as well. We had to have a, a passive pen handler. Uh, and then friction and conflict, and that can take place, you know, workplace, uh, conflict, uh, public, public places, public venues. Um, so, hey, sir, that's my parking spot, that kind of thing like that. You know, I, I've had parking spot disputes. Aggressive panhandler. And then physical contact and the leap of force. So we have to have a dial all the way up and down for this thing. But in the seventh dial, we had the big red button. And we can mash that big red button and we pull that pistol out. And, and if we introduce a pistol into a situation, situation even without firing, our lives have changed. If we fire that shot, then it's changed dramatically. And the big red button, I call it, you know, the, the last resort. But sometimes the uh, we immediately we we, we are default. We had to move to the last resort because that's how the what the, the situation is imposed upon us. Uh, but we take a lot of big red red button classes. We all come out and push the big red button, and I'm arguing that I think we need a broader skill set to support that. So with that, uh, Lee, here's my 2023 schedule. I'm wrapping up in uh, in Florida. Um, I've got I'm working with Shane for a class up there up your way. I have a class coming up uh, in in Maine, flying into that one with Tai China Whitlock, and, and and then I'm gonna be driving with Maslow all across the Great Atlantic country of ours. I'll probably see you again if not at Red Hill I'll, and uh, up in Georgia, then certainly again at, at TACCON. Uh, I am coast to coast. People have I've observed John Murphy hates the Midwest. There's no classes in the, in the Midwest. Just the way the schedule broke out this year, uh, I have a class being scheduled. It will be in September in Minnesota. Uh, next year, I'll be back in North Dakota. That's 2024. I'm, I'm still a little bit warped. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'll be all the way out across the country, down through California, and back across, ending up in Florida again the, the last, second week of, of December 2023. Uh, I'm, I'm look, at your, look, look at your map, look at your schedule. I'm coming to you pretty close, somewhere pretty close, I'm pretty sure of it, across the country. John, where's the best place for our audience to find your schedule? Oh, darn it. Uh, it would be uh, fpftraining.com, oh, right, right there at the, at the darn thing. fpftraining.com, still there? You can email me at john at fpftraining.com. And you will see, I have both a calendar laid out and I had this geospatially referenced one. Now, at the same time I'm around the country, I'm still keeping my a range open in Virginia. And I'm hosting some of our best friends and some of the best trainers in the industry at that range. I've got Susan Birch coming up uh, for his Cabanas class, Greg Lefferts, Wayne Dobbs is coming in May, Carl Wren is doing his foresight force and his advanced handgun work. Uh, this Tom Givens fellow, is showing up. Uh, and before him, I got John Hearn for cognitive pistol and, and, some, and some of his lectures. I've got Tim Kelly of Apache Solutions. Uh, all there in, in the Northern Virginia area. And I'm even teaching a class or two myself at my own range this year. And that will be in, uh, in September. Uh, the classes I'm teaching, I have, there are three on the road this year. I've got street and cover skills and tactics which is a two-day class, which covers, uh, hits a lot of the wickets that we discussed in this presentation. It's almost like I designed it that way. I don't know. Uh, I also have a class called Before, During, and After. It's a one-day class that hits the highlights. If you're already an accomplished shooter or have other skills and you want to get some skills for before the incident, so verbalization, pepper spray, things like that, and some after the incident skills, verbalization, uh, stopping bleeding, then before, during, and after would be for you. And then I have a class called Vehicle Environment Skills and Tactics. And it's a one-day class recognizing that the road rage environment and the car jacking environment, that, that deserves its own one-day approach. Because the car represents 
Well, it's a powerful inducement to violence. It's a, it's a substantially, uh, you know, uh, fi financially inducement to, they, they cost money. I mean, oh my God, a new car, forget about it. Uh, there's also things inside that car that people want, or they can take the car and drive it off to a chop shop and have and park it out and make a lot of money. And then there's the fact that we are interacting socially with people at 60 miles an hour. And friction and conflict is inevitable in that world. And you have to have a plan for that. And then there's actually the physical portion of the car it represents uh, an obstacle to move around. So in a parking lot, you can use your car as an obstacle to force people to come to you. You can, well, cover, consume it, the whole nine yards. Yeah, it's a pretty decent class. I just ran one here last week in Homestead, well-reviewed. There you go. Cool. Uh, I have taken or participated in the first class you mentioned, the street, street encounters, uh, probably three times now. Yep, coming up on number four shortly, and you yeah. will find it's changed appreciably from the last time you saw it. Uh, I always enjoy helping out with that class and everything because I always find new stuff to steal. I mean, I learn new new skills. And uh, uh, folks, John has a really good way of addressing these problems. And you know, here, here's the thing: John is selling you your chocolate covered vegetables. Yeah, you because know, everybody wants to come to the high end shooting class. And I want to, you know, as soon as that class, I need to be shooting at least a thousand rounds and everything. All right. John actually has a very analytical approach to this and is a building block approach. And you're going to accomplish all the things that you need to do. Like you're going to get practice in some of these soft skill uh, things that he talked about in, in this presentation tonight. And, I may want you. Yeah, and it's 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 always fun, uh, you know, to learn from those experiences because, you know, one of the things you talked about there was people don't train because of ego. And I think sometimes people don't go to force on force classes or mm -hmm. classes in which they're going to be challenged to think because they're worried about challenges to their ego. Well, the training environment is where you need to go have your colossal failures. Because that's where you need to have them learn from them so that your actual game time performance is not when you fail. Yeah, this, this is an environment in which you need to go challenge yourself and learn and better yourself. And, uh, you know, I routinely say that John's Traveling Roadshow is one of the three best Traveling Roadshows that's out there. And uh, you will learn a lot from it. And I, and I, I encourage you to sign up for it i know uh, we're trying to get together put together a class in south georgia uh shane ghost is going to be the prospective host for that we need a couple of more registrations for john's class to go down there and that range just to give you added incentive to go is just a couple of miles from the pow museum and so you can take a trip to and go take the class with, with John and visit the POW Museum. And I have been to that museum and the uh, the uh, military cemetery that accompanies it. Actually, have family buried in that cemetery. And uh, it's, 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 it's worth the trip just to go see the museum. So go see the museum and take John's class. Well, you know, we appreciate that as an experience law enforcement officer yourself. And I've had other, other cops take the class. Uh, when I was in Dallas this past year, I had uh, Greg Lefferts and Wayne Dobbs in the course. Mm -hmm. And between them, there's probably pretty darn close to 55, 60 years of experience. And uh, both were very laudatory of, of my soft skills approach because they're guys that have done it and they, they appreciate that. And this isn't to me, I'm teaching LE tactics, but there's a, when it comes to the verbalization bit, there's some bleed over there. Yeah. Now the, the difference is we just want to go home. I don't want to engage people in, in witty repartee. I want to verbally deflect and then depart. And that, that is the separation I have, as opposed to law enforcement. Well, they, if they're talking to you and it gets serious, they're going to lay hands and their mission is to enforce the law and arrest. Not, my, not our job. We just want to go home and we need some verbal deflection to achieve that. Uh, also threw in as far as the shooting skills, John has some very novel approaches uh, to the range time, 
and uh, I think you're going to be very, very uh, impressed with way way he presents the shooting material. And uh, I've stolen blatantly stolen uh, with bookmarks. I mean, excuse me, with footnotes so that everybody knows where it actually came from. Some of the stuff and and used it in some of my cop classes. And like some of the guys, like, wow, we want more of this. And uh, so, yeah, you're going to get the hard skill. Excuse me, the soft skill focus and training that you really john's one of the only places where you're going to get that but you're also going to get a unique approach to his hard skill uh, endeavors and very 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 worthwhile class and i highly encourage you to uh, well to make the effort to attend we thank you very much for your, your time this evening i appreciate the venue again uh i am considering uh our, our friend uh out in dallas as uh ask if I'm considering writing a book on this topic. And I, I'm not sure that people would, do people even read books anymore? I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I'm putting some thought into it because uh, there's a lot to be said to fill the gaps, a lot. Now, I appreciate your time at this venue this evening. Thank you very much. Well, John, I appreciate you coming along. And any other final thoughts before we close it out? I just hope to see you all in the range. All right, everyone. Uh, the show's numbers continuing to grow. Uh, I think I discussed in a recent episode that occasionally we have a, what I call a plateau buster, and which brings in a whole bunch of new audience to the show. And we tend to keep that audience once, once we uh, once we get them. Um, uh, the Miami incident show with Ed Morales was a plateau buster. And so the numbers of all the sub subsequent episodes since then have been very high, uh, both on the podcast side and the YouTube side. And the podcast side, uh, about three times the audience of the of the YouTube uh, videos. Um, that's thanks to you, the audience. And of course, we have great guests that come on, but uh, you know, the audience is choosing to, to play along and participate and find value in that. And I'm very, very appreciative of that. And I know that your most important asset is your time. And thank you for choosing to spend that with us.